So, hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming to watch my talk on 21st century war stories. Uh, big thanks to Steelcon to have me back for a second year. Uh, me and Dave Hardy did a talk on interactive PowerShell sessions with Metasploit last year. So, it's uh, great to be back again. Uh, I've tried to make sure there's something for everyone in this talk, so it's uh, not only focused on the uh, SE enthusiast, but also the professional red teamer. And if you've got any questions, uh, I'll, I'll take them all at the end. So the talk's going to run a little bit like this. Um, uh, recon's quite important um, in any penetration test, so I'll, I'll touch on that. Uh, talk about some of the current tooling, um, so com commercially paid for and open source. Uh, talk about getting inside the environment, um, infiltrating tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, persistence, so once we've got inside an environment, how we can stay in. Uh, lateral movement, and then acting on objectives. Uh, we're still going to talk about Posh C2, which we did a workshop on yesterday, uh, and hopefully do a live demo Hoping that the demigods are with us. So who am I? So uh, my name's Ben Turner, and for those of you who don't know, I'm a penetration tester and red teamer in Netitude. Uh, this is me before a beer, during a beer, and after a beer. Um, I've been through the Crest Team Leader exams and done my fair amount of IT health checks. Kind of think that makes quite a good foundation for a red teamer, because you've got all the sort of experience on the endpoints and general security inside an organization. As of late, most of my focus is on red teaming, SE, STAR, and CBEST. I've also got the simulated attack specialist exam, uh, which I've had now for almost two years. Also, not, to, not just a full-time hacking nerd. I uh, enjoy uh, biking, skiing, flying drones, traveling. Try not to combine the two. Uh, and I work for Netitude. Um, my Twitter handle is at Ben B. Turner, if you want to follow me. Bit of a disclaimer. Uh, the presentation reflects real live experiences. But um, the sensitivity has been redacted for client sensitivity, client confidentiality, sorry. So what is 21st century hacking? So 21st century hacking is amalgamation of social engineering, red teaming, star, and CBEST, and it's kind of the most cutting edge of all the assurance services. It kind of brings a mix of skill sets in order to, obtain, you know, in order to achieve an objective. It includes physical SE, USB drops, spear phishing, telephone calls, targeted social engineering, infrastructure hacking, and everything. That's kind of what I feel like it is. Uh, it's free from caveated auth forms. So, you know, there's no constraints, really, what a hacker can do, so why should we have them constraints? And in my opinion, you know, if you're not waking up at 3 a.m. to see if you've got a shell inside an organization, you haven't really experienced red teaming. What I tend not to class red teaming as is sort of blowing the doors off a building with C4 and accessing the computer systems. That's more of a military term. So this is kind of what I think uh, red teaming is. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, when people ask me, you know, why should we do red teaming, I kind of focus on this one story. So we were hacking a bank over in the Middle East, and uh, they've had lots of penetration tests, and they thought they were fairly secure. Um, so the pictures kind of speak for themselves. It's just a normal ATM. Uh, and in the back, it was actually been jammed open by someone else, not me. So I saw a nice uh, Cisco switch hanging out the back of it. So this is, the, this is the lock that was literally ripped off, held on with wood, which is nice. Um, so what we did then was able to actually plug in the Cisco switch and, uh, and see the complete, basically over the 3G, 4G network, uh, see all the bank systems. I was able to RDP onto the main controller. I was able to hack all the systems literally from that ATM machine. So I kind of, you know, why focus on all the internal in insider threat when you can kind of focus on everything? So that's kind of what I, I feel like it is really. Um, this is another example of another ATM. Just this is how it was sealed, another Cisco switch, 3G router, so we were just able to plug in and get access to the network. And they even put a nice IP address with their default gateway and everything for me, so I didn't even have to work hard to get that. So everything we do, we kind of map it back to a cyber attack chain, um, the kill chain from Lockheed Martin, so reconnaissance, delivery, exploitation, pivoting, and data exfiltration. So I'll kind of focus this whole talk around them five sort of fundamental key principles. Um, I guess red teaming also uh, fundamentally it get, kind of provides risk to the organization uh, and everything we kind of do we base on a threat so it depends which type of threat actor we're trying to mimic. Uh, sometimes it can be sort of the lone wolf or the script kitty and sometimes we might be trying to mimic a sort of nation state. So depending on what type of organization, uh, type of, type of organization you're targeting might you know, change the way you attack it. These are different threat actors and their capability. So ranging, like I said, from uh, script kitty or lone wolf, 
with, with not much capability, sort of easy to fingerprint, easy to detect, to sort of going right up to the, end of the other end of the scale, which is nation state or state sponsored. So which has got like custom cryptography, very, very much anti-detection capabilities and zero days, things like that. Uh, and it's a lot harder to fingerprint and detect. <coughs> so I guess uh, recon is really the most important um, principle in every penetration test. Uh, I kind of live by the analogy, proper planning prevents piss poor performance, and I really think it does. Um, every pen test I've done, if you do enough recon, sometimes you don't even need to actively target the organization because you can just get in on the recon data that you've actually got. Uh, most importantly, the more you can find out about the environment, the better you can attack it, the better you can sort of weaponize your payloads, your comms, things like that. So, you know, it's a great way to go. The tools I simply uh, tend to use is Multigo. DNS reconnaissance, who is records, media, social networking, GitHub, um, obviously, obviously you can read it for yourselves, um, but search, even search engines, just you know, normal search engine op, uh, searches like Google Hacking Database and things like that. Previous breaches are really good as well because obviously they've got a lot of information and often credentials might st still even work. Um, so DNS is a really interesting one. So I was targeting an organization recently uh, and I didn't think they were that savvy in terms of uh, email security. But actually, when doing some DNS reverse lookups, I found out that they were using Mimecast. So I was like, oh, bugger. Probably not going to get in here. So just having that knowledge, I was able to adapt my attack method to actually, because I know Mimecast is pretty good at blocking attachments. So I was like, right, this, this time I'm not going to send a document in. I'm going to send a link to a document, because I know it won't probably pick that up. So you know, just having that insider information that's freely available is really good when you target an organization. So email tools, um, so email recon and tools that I use. So um, a, a guy next year wrote a tool called Prowl, which is pretty cool. Um, so it'll go away and use um, LinkedIn. It'll grab all the information from LinkedIn and give you basically a great list of email addresses. Also um, picks up on other stuff as well, but I'll go on that in a minute. Um, simply email, The Harvester, Maltigo, Fokker, and obviously previous breaches like I just mentioned. So these, these are great ways to get information when you target an organization. You do need to know the format of the email, so you can probably do that by doing some manual searching against the organization. Um, but I guess pick, pick wisely, because um, you know, if you are targeting an organization and you've got sort of a, an end objective that you know you want to get on this banking app or you want to get on this server, you know, LinkedIn might tell you that that guy actually runs that part of the company. So actually, you, know, you don't have to do any lateral movement if you can just get on his machine. So again, it comes down to research and recon. Uh, this is Prowl, so one of the tools that you might want to consider. Um, it also now uh, cross-checks against Have I Been Pwned, so it'll pull back all the information. It'll tell you if any of these email addresses have been in the Have I Been Pwned database. So I guess uh, knowing your terminology when doing this type of engagement as well, so spam, phishing, and spoofing, so there are sort of quite significant differences. Spam sort of unsolicited bulk email, like, irrespective of content. Uh, phishing is like a type of spam, but it's normally intended to get sensitive information, or like fake PayPal invoices, that sort of thing. And then spoofing is normally sort of when you spoof the from address, so when you try and it, you know, impersonate someone else. Uh, also know the countermeasures as well, so you can tell the client what they can do to try and help mitigate this, so like sender ID, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. I had quite a lot of success recently, actually, um, from doing an engagement where when I was targeting them, I, I did some recon on their email gateway system. And uh, I didn't use the very top mail gateway, but I was able to use the third one and actually spoof the from address. So, but not, not spoofing the address from any random email. I was actually using the company name and sending it emails from themselves. So it was like, almost like an open mail relay, but back into themselves. Uh, so the great thing with this is, with Outlook, it, it's, it's a trusted domain. So if you insert like UNC pass or images, they'll automatically download because it's a trusted domain. So that's a great way to, uh, to get inside an organization. You don't need to buy domains to hack them. You can basically just use their own mail server. So often, it's a really good idea to check that first. So the current tool in, uh, in the industry at the moment, so Metasploit, one of the best open source penetration testing frameworks, but I wouldn't say it's great for red teaming. Uh, it's quite noisy, and it's not, not very stealthy. It's been signatured by a lot of CM and AV products as well. Um, but the, the reverse HTTPS comms are still pretty good, and you can have set timeouts and sleep now. Um, but I, I still probably wouldn't use it as a, as a red teaming organ Sorry, as a red teaming tool. Uh, Empire is really good, um, but I've had some issues with proxying. Um, but it's a great tool. It's got some great modules and some lateral movement. And Cobalt Strike. Uh, it's, it's not the cheapest, but it is probably you know, one of the best tools out there for red teaming. 
So getting in. So I kind of had like a 100% success rate so far. Um, I guess one of the main reasons is sort of proxy aware payloads and kind of making sure that all your emails or, or your phishing or everything is pretty, I guess, trustworthy. Um, if you can mimic sort of like you say a nation state or something like that, then you know, you're pretty likely to get in. Some of the things that we use are sort of VBA. So macros still work amazingly. Uh, you can put PowerShell in macros. You can put standalone executables in macros. Uh, documents with OLE objects. Um, again, another one that's really, really good is hosting Java files uh, in, a, in an applet form on websites and sending links to that. Uh, I'll always so sign that sort of thing because uh, default settings on Java is high. Uh, so high means it won't accept anything that's not signed. So if you're doing that type of attack, I would go ahead and get yourself a code signing cert. Uh, link files as well, quite a good one recently that's come out. So you can send a link file within an email. When they open the link file, it's basically a link to PowerShell and it runs a bit of code. Uh, click once, uh, done quite a bit click once recently, that's also good as well, especially when you're targeting stuff like Citrix. Um, site cloning, again, that's a really, really good one. You can just sort of send an email saying, hi, we've just upgraded the Citrix system, can you all try and log in? So you can capture their system, uh, credentials and things. And even if they're using 2FA, you can get around that as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. But even sometimes, you know, before you've even sent a, a sort of phishing campaign, you might want to just try like a simple brute force against the systems, even if they even say they are 2FA. So I was actually um, testing, uh, again, another, another quite prestigious client, and they had a Citrix uh, 2FA system on the internet, which I was quite interested in. Um, so because it said username, password, and passcode, I was like, oh, this is never going to work. But I thought, oh, what the hell, I'll, I'll try a simple brute force anyway. So using the email addresses that I got from, um, from uh, the LinkedIn breach, uh, basically I, I targeted the organization, sent, I can't remember the passwords now, password one across everyone, I managed to actually get in. Uh, so not all accounts are subject to 2FA. You actually got to set that up, so it's always, always worth trying that. Uh, and then actually, yeah, got access to literally a lot of banking information. And what was interesting, I, I kind of hit jackpot, really, literally. Um, the credit card data was stored on this server, external facing on the internet, and got access to, I can't remember how many now, 25,000 credit card details in the clear. So, uh, and that was literally, I didn't even have to target the organization. I just sent a quick brute force from the internet uh, and got in. So it, you know, it is amazing. How, how simple it can be, even if they got to a FA. Um, so I guess the way um, to increase you know, the success rate is increasing the trustworthiness of all your attachments, all your emails, all your links, everything like that. Um, so what ways you can do that is um, legitimizing um, sort of code signing certs, purchasing burner phones. Uh, so you, basically to get a code signing cert, you have to have a company. So we've registered a company with a PO box. And then you can basically go ahead and get a code signing cert. It's quite a lengthy process to go through, but for doing this type of engagement, if you're trying to sort of uh, mimic a threat actor that's sort of nation state or something like that, or even activists or activists, you're going to want probably a code signing cert. Also using things like Let's Encrypt, it's like a free SSL certificate. So when they see the padlock in the bottom right corner, they feel all nice, warm, and fuzzy, so they'll probably click your link. Um, yeah, so as I said before, Java default is high, so it won't uh, run if it's an unsigned applet. So that's me, just an example of uh, an applet I've used. Uh, and basically, yeah, it's all signed, so it doesn't put any nice red errors. Uh, another interesting one as well is site email reputation. So a lot of the, um, I guess, more prestigious clients of ours use quite good um, WebSense filters. So they're blocking things like un unknown or recently created IP addresses or just direct IP addresses. So we're having to really um, go ahead and now create websites on the internet uh, and leave them running for sort of six months just to get some reputation, just as, I don't know, brochureware or something. So if you're doing this type of thing against you know, quite, quite a big client or something that's got, got a bit of security savviness, um, then you might want to be doing this because, as you can see at the bottom there, this is, like the area you, this is the area they would get if you send a campaign in, so you, none of your stuff's going to come back out. A good way of doing it is um, submitting your site to Google, and there's a WebSense um, URL uh, page you can actually submit to as well, um, so they get reputation then, and then you, you won't have any issues. Also, don't use dynamic DNS. We've seen that blocked a lot as well. Uh, so on, on some of the early days, we started to use that, and, and again, I, I tried to uh, not use that if I was you. So another way we often get in is targeting sort of site cloning or, or credential harvesting. So an interesting one is um, Citrix again. So when, when you think it's got 2FA, um, if you just send in basically uh, saying, yeah, we've just upgraded Citrix, blah, 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 and you clone their page, 
uh, you'll actually, you can have some nice cool JavaScript embedded in the website so that it actually offloads the credentials to a third party site. So literally in real time, I was getting these credentials out and was able to actually log into the site re re you know, properly. And if you redirect, if you do it right and you redirect the actual cloned site back to the original site and just like get it with a sort of fair login page or something, they log in a second time and get in. And at that time, they don't think anything of it. They think, oh, great, my credentials still work. But actually, you've got a foothold inside the organization. And having a foothold in Citrix is kind of the, the best one because you can always break out of Citrix to PowerShell. Literally, I don't think I've ever been on a test where you can't break out of Citrix to a command prompt. So when, when I'm sending in some sort of phishing campaigns, clients really like analytical data. They love graphs. Um, so the way I kind of do that is have a three-stage approach. So inside the email that I will send, I'll put um, a web book, basically, uh, with, which will have a random integer. So I, I can target and say how many unique random integers have I got back. And then also, if I'm sending in a payload, I can put in a web book inside the payload. And then if I've got, obviously, a document with a macro or an OLE object, if that gets executed, I know if I've compromised the machine. So you can have a nice graph at the end, which basically says, look, here's all the emails sent. Here's how many people open the emails. Here's how many documents opened. And here's how many hosts were compromised. Just quite a nice graph when you're doing this type of engagement. So they, you know, they can use this and then go, right, we need to now perform security, um, security awareness training off the back of your engagement. And as you can see there, in my logs, I'll just see like 1.png and then the ID. But also it's good as well because you know who's opened your email. Um, so you can say specifically that user. Not that we you know, condone sort of telling people who, who the unlucky people are that clicked our links, but it's good to have that data anyway. So UNC Pass, hopefully you went to Neil's talk, but he talked more on this. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a really good way of getting inside an organization. Again, a lot of the clients that are, I guess, more developed and have got sort of good firewalls and things probably won't allow this. Um, but if you have a UNC Pass inside of an email, um, you can actually capture the hash, the NTLM hash, providing the allow port 445 outbound. So we've done this on loads of engagements, and you can just basically get a hash. So it's, you get the SMB NTLM challenge hash. So again, you can crack that and use that on single factor systems on the internet. So it's a really good way of sending, it, you know, sending in um, an email with a malicious sort of attachment or something. Um, the interesting one with this is, like, even if you're targeting like, maybe a bank or something, which you know this isn't going to be allowed, uh, if people are working from home, basically, and they don't always have a no-split VPN, then basically they'll be using BT home hubs, crappy firewalls, anything like that, 4 for 5 straight outbound. So, you know, it's worth thinking even against the more sort of security aware clients to put this type of attack in. So, you can basically, there's a Metasploit module, do it for, I do always do it manually, but the Metasploit module provide it a document and it'll basically weaponize it with a UNC path. Once you uh, crash that, crack the hashes, you can log into OWA. Literally, the amount of times I've typed password in OWA and you get like lots of information back, or Wi Fi. People are often sending the Wi Fi code out over the um, Outlook. And so you can just basically go outside the organization, hook up to the Wi Fi, and you get access to the network. So these are the ways you can kind of red team the organization. Again, without even really sending anything in. Again, another one link we often try and log into. Oh, also, you can, um, if, if you actually manage to get into Outlook, uh, as some user, you can kind of reply to all. So if they've got a company-wide email address, you reply to all, add a UNC in there, and you'll get about, well, however big the company is, you'll get 1,000 thousand UNC paths coming out at you with 1,000 hashes. So that's another good way of doing it. Um, so often we send macros in. Uh, macros are usually, by default, uh, disabled, but they do have a notification. So as long as you can put something in the document, for example, like this, um, and say, oh, you know, to, to enable the content, in this document, please click enable content. And obviously, that will enable your macro and give you a foothold. But they think nothing's happened, and then you make the image change or something like that. So again, one I always do is a CV. So I've got a nice little CV here. Uh, that's not me, obviously. Um, but it looks encrypted. So I've put a little image at the top of it, say, oh, this is fault, uh, fake encoding. Please click enable content to show the image. And then the image appears, and they're like, oh, yeah, warm and fuzzy. Yeah, it all works. Uh, as I said before, click once is really good, especially if you're targeting something like Citrix. Uh, I've talked a lot about Citrix, like that. Um, but when you basically first go to Citrix, it asks you to install something. So that's why click once works really well, because as soon as you get onto this page, if you clone a website or something and send an, an email in, once they click, click install, it'll actually pop up the, pop up the box and go, oh, host checker. Yeah, oh, I'll run that because I, I need to do that, because it always does that anyway. So it's you know, just legitimizing your attacks to make them, uh, make them feel warm and fuzzy. 
Um, always anonymize your traffic. So depending on what threat actor you're trying to mimic, in these engagements, um, you, you don't want them to like, look up the address that the C2 traffic is going on and say Netitude. They're like, oh, right, oh, it's a pen test. Right, we don't want that. Um, so always anonymize it. So the way you, do, you can do this is by VPSs all around the world. So you can even put them in China and Russia and all places like that. Um, so you can use either simple IP tables rules, which just forwards 80 and 443 back to your server. Just completely anonymizes the traffic. Or you can create like some funky scripts, which we've got some Python scripts, which basically says, if it's legitimate web traffic, someone just wants to see if this is a dodgy site, it goes and puts them off to the website that you created. Or if it's C2 traffic, put it back to my C2 server. So putting all this together, uh, one day in the red teaming world, uh, I sent uh, my CV into the recruitment company. Um, I got my 1.png back, which so I knew she opened the email. Uh, got the attachment back, and I got the macro executed. So I did actually have UNC in this one, which was interesting. Um, so the UNC was blocked uh, by default, which I kind of thought it would be. But what was really interesting is uh, never fear because Enterprise Vault is here. Enterprise Vault, for some reason, sent me a hash, and I was like, well, where did this even come from? And it was a domain admin. So it was like zero to here in about five minutes. And I was like, what? I've actually got a fold in the organization with domain admin in five minutes. Go home. Thanks very much. So uh, again, another, another really good reason to use UNC. Even if you think it is blocked, you might get some random things like I had. Uh, and it, it's really, really interesting. Oh, yeah, so that's, that was basically where I was. I was able to access all the data center and everything from where I was from that initial foothold with the A creds. So I was able to get screenshots access the payroll, and what better way to show risk than to show the CEO's payslip on the report. She earned a lot, by the way. But, you know, a shell is only the beginning. Um, sure, it's great to get lots of shells. Yeah, it's a dick measuring contest. Yeah, I've got 320 shells. Woo but to be honest, it's, it's only the initial foothold inside the organization. So it's the lateral movement and access in the crown jewels, which is where the real sort of red teaming comes in. But before that happens, I guess we need to be you know, aware where we are. Don't forget, when you're doing this type of engagement, you're going in blind. So you don't know what the organization looks like. You don't know what the network layout is. You don't even know if you've actually compromised the right machine. You might be on Bob's home machine. But, you know, so you need to just ensure that you're you know, doing the right thing here. So make sure your implants landed on the correct system. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, is it on a desktop? Is it on a VDI? Is it on a laptop? Is the system joined to a domain? What's the system uptime? What's the date? What's the language even? Uh, so I was on a job once, and uh, I landed on a, an, an Algeria randomly. And I was trying to add my user to the local admin group. And it was like, no, it's not working, not working. And I was pulling my hair out about 30 minutes, and it's administrators or something in French. So just knowing that little sort of difference makes, goes a long way, really. So uh, persistence via Michael. So here's another little story. So again, we applied for a job. Uh, at the top of the CV, we had our boat burner phone number, and a guy came, a name Michael, calls the phone. So there three of us in the room at the time, and we were all a bit nervous, going, oh, the phone's ringing. Not really sure what was going on here. So he was like, no, you answer it, you answer it, you answer it. So anyway, I answered it. So he said, oh, hi there, we've got your CV, and uh, yeah, yeah, great, yeah. He says, uh, but there seems to be a problem with it. There's, there's a picture, but it, I think it's like all encrypted. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, there's a problem with it. Is there an enable, enable content button? Yeah, yeah, click it. I, I got a shower, so I was pretty happy. And I was like, did the image show? He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, great, yeah, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. So anyway, I got a nice little shell. Um, so the reason why I'm saying this is that we got an implant in the organization. So the next thing we did was try to install persistence. So un unfortunately for us, it failed. So we installed it. It was on a VDI, um, uh, and we did it in the registry. But we put the bat file on the C in the C drive so that when the guy then logged back in the next day, he got a random VDI. So we thought, all right, OK, maybe I'll try sending him the document again. So we sent Mike, Michael the CV and said, oh, you know, I've made a few updates. Would you mind just opening it and PDFing it and sending it back? And we thought, mm, he might not. Anyway, Shell comes back in. Yes, got another foothold inside the organization. Um, anyway, second time, we thought, right, we need to nail this this time. We need the persistence. Um, so we were like, yeah, right, we put it here. We put it in the registry, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, for another reason, it failed. And we thought, no, we, we can't send a third email. Surely not. But yeah, he clicked the email, and we got in persistence again. So I guess the important thing to take away is you, know, you might not always be lucky and get a guy like Michael uh, inside the organization. So just make sure when you're running the persistence, put it in the right place uh, and check if you're on a VDI or something like that. So when doing this type of engagement, there's four ways that I think you can reliably get persistence. 
So if you're in user land, then the guess, best way for me is registry run keys. So whenever they log out and log back in, something, whatever's in that registry run key will run. So if you point that to a bat file or even PowerShell directly in there, it'll run. If you've actually managed to escalate the system, you can do the same thing on the HKLM, which will basically, once a machine boots in, it'll run. A scheduled task. So you can create a scheduled task to run every 24 hours or every 60 minutes or whatever you want. So that's another really good way of doing it. Sometimes in, in environments that is actually locked down, so you can't use scheduled tasks. But I find more times than not, you, you can do that approach. And also, um, if, you're, if you are a system on a, on a box, you can actually create a service, which is one of the best and most effective methods. Um, Harmjoy has also done some good stuff on WRI events. So that's also a really good and stealthy way to get inside and have persistence, especially if you're you know, tackling a, quite a good blue team that knows what they're doing. Also, one thing to be aware of is, is, I go on about it quite a lot, but is making sure your payloads are proxy aware. So if you've escalated to system, system isn't going to know what the proxy server is in the, inside the organization. It's not going to have credentials on the domain to even get out. So you need to make sure that you're creating payloads that you can put in the proxy. So Metasploit's got a good one, um, HTTPS proxy. And it allows you to actually go, right, this is the proxy server, this is the port, this is the username, this is, this is the password. So just to be aware of it, because again, this is an issue when you escalate to system. People think, oh yeah, just install persistence in the service, yeah, happy days. It just won't work, especially if it's a lockdown environment. So other post-exploitation uh, techniques that I use quite a lot is things like cred, um, cred popper and uh, key logging. So just popping up a credential harvest, credential box on the, on the screen saying Outlook needs your credentials, a really effective way to get the password. If they don't click it the first time, if you do it 100 times, they'll, they'll do it. Um, so I guess the main goal uh, of a red team engagement is to get the critical assets or the applications. And often this isn't always integrated Windows authentication, so sometimes it might be Oracle or Swift or any banking app that doesn't rely on AD. So actually, you might need to get their credentials for that as well. So that's why I ended up using key logging. Sometimes I've even killed the application that we're running so that it'll just re-auth. So then I can capture their credentials. So just an example of the banking suite that I was trying to attack. Basically, I had to wait until they logged in, force the application to close, and then I could access the banking application. So it brings me on to another little story. So we approached a guy called Andrew. Uh, Andrew may or may not have been a network specialist um, in his current role. So I may also have slightly oversold him in UIT role in another organization. Um, I offered him pretty stupid salaries, working from home all the time, good pension, private health care. I really did sell it to this guy. Um, it probably wasn't fair in hindsight. And he did send me some bad messages after, but, but yeah, we'll, we'll get back onto that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so basically on the phone, so I needed this guy to basically click something, and it was very, very um, targeted, because I wanted this guy, because he was a network engineer, I wanted to make sure that he, because he had access to all the crown jewels, basically, so I didn't need to actually move, so I really wanted to work on this guy. So I called him a few times, and he was, he was very clever, he said, oh no, yeah, I'll go home and I'll do this, because obviously he didn't want to, when I was acting as a recruiter, he didn't want to do any of this in work time. And I was like, oh no, no, we've got an, an anonymized form that you can fill out. Basically, it just creates... Um, it creates an agreement between me and you, and that means I can act on your behalf and work with this organization. So I had a Java payload basically embedded inside the application, and he literally had to go on and put, yeah, legal full name, email, I agree that this content shall be governed by UK law. Click that box. As soon as you click that box, I got a shell, basically. Um, so yeah, he did that happily. <laughs> so what was really interesting, when I got on his, his machine, I started doing some uh, key logging, and because I'd really sold this job to him, he, he was actually going to kit out his office at home, so he's buying chairs and printers and things like this, and I was like, oh no, he's only doing this because I've sold him a job at working from home. But actually, he, he did have the keys to the kingdom. He was on all the switches, all the firewalls, all the routers, and, after, and because of doing some key logging, uh, basically I, I got everything. And that's all I needed to do. I didn't even need to latch remove. It could have been worse, though. Uh, it could have been my mate who, who targeted people on LinkedIn with that picture. Um, I probably could have broke his marriage up, so I'm glad I didn't do that. So lateral movement. Um, it's a key point in the cyber kill chain, and it's, you know, it's a key point to act on your objectives, because usually they're not quite as easy as that one that I showed you back there. Um, so usually the way I do it is um, I would employ sort of Metasploit at this point, because it's got a great SOX proxying capability. So you can actually use proxy chains with the SOX proxy and use any tool on your Kali, Kali machine or Windows machine. <coughs> or Windows machine, whatever it is that you use. Um, 
it's just a great way of basically targeting an organization with what you would normally use as an internal pen test. Uh, CNTLM also does the same thing, but you'd have to use SSH to do the proxy server. Uh, obviously, you can use uh, normal things like sort of uh, PowerShell, WinRM, WMI, that sort of thing. Um, but if you really want to just get in and use your own tools, I would just tend to use the SOX proxy stuff. So that, that's the module, if anyone doesn't know what it is, but that's a SOX server, basically. It creates, if you get a shell with Matsploit, um, basically you can use this module, and it will open up a port in your box, and you can then use proxy chains through it. And you can just use all your normal tools like Medusa, uh, RDP, SMB, Map, or anything like that, basically. So you might be really lucky, uh, and you might have a guy who's got the document open with all his passwords. And then actually, obviously, I, I, again, coming back to Citrix, but I do love Citrix. Um, and what I often find with Citrix is, because people use them all the time, they don't really patch Citrix servers. So again, once you break out, go onto PowerShell, yeah, elevated shell, run MS1632 and get system. And then do all your normal stuff like Mimikatz, drop the domain admin credentials out. So this is again why I love Citrix. You can always break out and do something really cool with it. And then RDP on the domain controller. Again, this is all from home. And access all these applications, banking applications, transfer money, make payments. Again, all from home. Access all the legal documents. Again, banking applications. SQL servers. So SQL servers is quite an interesting one. If they use things like Imperva, uh, Imperva will log access to databases, basically, on a network level. But what's interesting is if you RDP actually onto the SQL server and go through the manager here, none of that's logged. So that's a good way of getting around when you're doing like a red team versus blue team type thing. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of my social engineering and sort of red teaming background. Uh, so, me and Dave Hardy over there created a tool called Posh C2 to help alleviate all this, um, all this stuff. And I'm going to do, try and do a live demo. I'll do a quick introduction first. So, it's, um, it's maintained free and open source. It was inspired by some of the stuff we did in Metsploit last year. Uh, and it, it kind of allows you to learn PowerShell in a phased approach. So most people get scared when they open PowerShell and it throws red errors. So this is quite a good way of getting you to use PowerShell. It's all AES encrypted uh, with a 128-bit key. It's got an auto kill switch. So if you you know got a, a really risky customer who doesn't like to do this type of engagement, you can say, well, you know, even if we do land and we, you know, for some reason don't manage to get the shells gone in two weeks, it'll be all, you know, if it hits that two-week mark, it'll just automatically kill the shells. So it's kind of just like a, a risk mitig mitigation thing. So it's not only a red teaming tool, it's um, also basically a penetration testing toolkit. Simple and really easy to install. Basically, we've written a little installer, one line, it'll do everything for you. The only thing it doesn't do is install JDK, which you need to create the Java payloads, if you want to do that. Works on PowerShell version 2 and above, so Windows 7, 8, 10, Vista, anything like that. Uh, it's based on customizable HTTP beacons, so you can set them to however long you want, five seconds, 10 seconds, two minutes, three minutes, all things like that. It's also got a 10% jitter, so if you've got a sort of a blue team that's monitoring traffic like maybe every 60 seconds, it'll, it's a bit of jitter, so it sort of transfers it from like 55 to 65, etc. It's maintainable and modular, that's again one of the big things, so we're not saying we're gurus in PowerShell, but basically we're just giving you the opportunity to use PowerShell modules in, in a red team engagement. So all the modules with hard jewelry, things like that, he's written some great modules. You can put these in the, in the modules folder and load them on the, you know, load, load them on the client. Again, I'll show you this in a minute. Um, it's been tested against sort of FireEye, Palo Alto. We've done some quite clever stuff with image heuristics. So if they actually put all the traffic back together, there's all you would see is a little image of like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. So it's actually really quite cool. Uh, and again, one of the main things about doing this type of, type of job is that you need to give the blue team something to work on. Obviously, yeah, it's great to say I got in, but you need to say, well, I accessed this, I did this, and I did this, and I compromised these machines. So one of the most important things for us is this output to HTML function. So it basically tells you every implant that you've got on, on, the, on, on the implant. Sorry, every implant you've got uh, on each co uh, workstation. And it also tells you every command you've run and every output. So if you forget to uh, get a screenshot of some, it's always in there. So let's, uh, let's give this a go. So basically, when you open it up, uh, it'll say, 
No, that's not working good. Why is that? Oh, I haven't got an IP. Sorry, hold on one sec. I need a demigod to work with me. Going well. Oh. Yeah, no, it's not that now. Oh. oh, come on. I'm gonna have to reboot this machine, just bear with two seconds. Sorry. It's Windows, it all works once you switch it off and on again. Demo God, should have videoed it, knew it. I know. It was a ballsy move and it failed. That's what I mean, it's just me. BGA. All right, we're back, sorry about that. So this is what it should look like when you get an IP. So basically it'll get the IP from the network adapter, which at the moment is just 172, 16, 180, 128. Um, so the first thing it'll ask you is what IP do you want to use or what C, what's the C2 sort of server in the back end. So usually this would be like the URL that you're using um, in the engagement. So it might be the domain that you've bought or the, just the external facing IP. So usually it's not an internal IP. So once you've done that, it'll ask you basically, basically what folder you want to put it in. It'll just give you a temporary name. Default beacon time, so if you want to set that to anything less or more than five seconds. And it's got the auto kill screech date, so you can actually extend that or, or make it less if you want to. And then the default port. Again, I'd always recommend 80 or 443, just because when you're in them proxy aware environments, 80 and 443 are generally what is only allowed out. And then what it'll do is it'll create you, for, the, for red teaming, that's actually meant to be red, but it's black. Uh, so it'll create your Java payload. Again, it's unsigned, so if you get a code signing suit, you can actually then basically sign that and then host it somewhere on the internet. 
It will create you a batch file, which is kind of just more used for internals. Um, it will create you a macro payload that, again, you can just put straight into a Word document to weaponize it and send into the client. And it will also create you a .lnk file, again, if you want to send that into the organization. Uh, it's also uh, another way you can run it on, on internals is basically with, like, the top one there, which is PowerShell, happen exec bypass, that one. So that's just a quick way of doing it, but it's not always proxy aware that way because um, it's using the download cradle. So I would always, always use that only on internals. I would use the other ways when you're doing a red team and engagement. Also, if you want to try and bypass AppLock or Bit9, SubT has written some cool stuff about it and how to use install util. So I've actually Im embedded that as well. So that will not even use any executables on the disk. So if they've got Bit9 or anything like that, then that'll just work and it'll allow you to get a foothold. So also, another window will open, which is here, which is the implant window. So that's how you actually give commands. So this server is the C2 server, and this is the implant handler. So all, all, the, so all the commands and everything will actually output here, all on the screen. But this is what you use to basically interact with the clients and, and the footholds once you've got them. So I'll just go ahead and run the payload on my machine, just to show you what it looks like. I run the bat file, and there you go, as you can see. It gives you the encryption key that it's using to encrypt all the traffic back and forth. It tells you a bit about the client, so what domain it's on, which is Windows 10 Spoon, uh, what user, what the architecture of the machine is, and the process that actually it's injected into, which is 4688A, and the default sleep time. So then you can go ahead and use the implant, basically, on this window. So it's basically just a command line now, so you can run whatever you want. So we've written some quite cool modules in it, but you can just use it like you run normal PowerShell commands. So anything like who am I, everything will work. So what, when it first does it, it loads the implant core, which has got a few features and stuff, uh, and then again it will run your command. So some of the modules we've written, and some of the modules we haven't, but again, that's the great thing about this tool, is you can put any module in there and, ju and just load the module by just doing load module, blah, 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 and it will just load the module inside, inside the organization, basically on the client machine that you've compromised. So it's got some, a lot of stuff in here. Again, I won't go through it all, but basically this is just a bit of a demo um, just to show you what it can do. All the traffic is obviously going over HTTP, but it's all encrypted. It all looks like images, which there's also a temporary image. So if you go inside the, te the folder that you've created, Koshi2, blah, 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 there'll be something called temp heuristic image, which will just be the image that gets, um, that gets sent back and forth with the binary encrypted data. So basically that's all I'll see. Um, some of the cool things you can do with it, um, well, you can use any of the modules that you want in PowerShell, uh, but I guess some of the great things is like get screenshot, so. But again, have a, have a play with it. It's all on GitHub, GitHub slash netitude slash posh c2, um, but it's really quite cool. Um, but yeah, I, I won't go through it all, but that's basically essentially what it does and how it works. Uh, loads of things like cred popper again, that's quite a cool one, which I was saying before. But everything that I do on a red team engagement, I kind of, we've kind of put into this. So we've kind of done all the hard work for you. Because I've got a wiki, which I've got all my notes for. So when running a red team, and I might maybe wanted to latch remove using WMI or something. So instead of me having a wiki now, I've basically just ported all that into here. So all the commands and everything, it's all there. You can see what it's actually running. So that's the great thing. We're not trying to hide anything. And we want you to actually learn when you use this tool. So just for example, like the pop-up box. Basically, that's what it's running on the client. So you know, we're not trying to hide anything. You can see it. You can run your own PowerShell commands. Here's the cred popper here. There we go, root. That's the username and that's the password. So that's a really good way of getting to use the passwords. So yeah, that's just a bit of a quick demo. Uh, the output takes some is quite cool as well, which I was telling you about. Uh, again, I won't have got anything here. Oh, it's on my slides now. So I'll just return to the slides in a minute. Yeah, so a bit of a roadmap. So we're trying to create more methods um, of the initial payloads. We really want to do a click once so that when you open it, it'll automatically have a click once application there. Uh, we want to create a HTA, which is like a hypertext application, HTML application, again, which you might want to use when you're sending into the organization. Uh, what we also like to do is have a daisy chain method. So once you target one machine in the organization, um, you might want to then laterally move. But instead of them all going out of the proxy, maybe just use one host. So that would be quite a cool little feature. Also like to implement process migration. So you're always in the, at the moment in like a PowerShell process. 
So I'd like to be able to inject into another process, another running process. But for that, we have to do a few things with DLLs and things. It gets quite complicated, probably far beyond my knowledge. Uh, autocomplete, yeah, that would be really quite cool. Um, so you don't have to type things. It's everything autocompletes, but that's Dave's job. <laughs> but feel free to do pull requests. Uh, that's how you access it. That's how you download it. Uh, we're actively doing things basically daily, uh, probably too much, to be honest. Um, but yeah, have a look at it, download it, mess with it. It's all PowerShell. It's basically two code, two lines, of, sorry, two lines of code. That'd be nice. Uh, two scripts itself. So you've got the C2 server and you've got the implant handler. So it's really easy to edit. Even you don't have to know much PowerShell. So as I said, the logging is really the important part for us. So as you can see here, this like basically shows you. Yeah, that's the command one. That's the implant. So you get two HTML files. That one will tell you all the implants you got when you first saw them, when you last saw them, the IP address, that should be the external IP address, because I'm doing it internally, that's the internal IP address, and the user, and this is all the commands and everything. So if you forget to do something, you can just take a screenshot of that. And it tells you exactly what you've done. So you can literally go, here you go, this is what we did inside the organization. So there's just some reference stuff that you might want to use. So anyway, I believe NetChoose sponsored the bar, which is the most important thing. Uh, I think we went through and finished the bar at about half one last year, so if we can try and make it 12 this year, that'd be good. Uh, if you want to grab me for a beer after, catch up, anything, cool. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Is it just beer, or is it everything? <laughs> <laughs> Define everything. Yeah, I think so. Sweet. <laughs> Any more? Cool. All right, let's go get beer.